Hello everybody, uh, welcome to YouTube Fishing number seven. Uh, in this series we try to help you to catch more subscribers and get more views. For today's video I'm going to be covering my studio. Now a few weeks ago I did a collaboration with Alex over at Realistic Fishing. where he covered the topics of intros as well as a home studio. Now Alex went above and beyond and actually created kind of a fit fishing atmosphere background studio. But I, I think it really fits his channel because he does a lot of um, unboxings, uh, reviews, he does a lot of giveaways on his channel. So I think that background really fits into what he's doing when he's showing new lures and reels and showing stuff that he's going to give away and that kind of stuff. Uh, for me, I don't know, I was fine with just basically a normal background, but I did want it to be nicer. Okay, so you can see from my earlier videos. Hello everybody, uh, Steve again. I uh, just want to give you a final wrap up of the day. Uh, it was shit. To now. So let me give you a quick tour of my studio. All right, let's start off just off camera here to my left where I'm sitting, your right. But I do have my DIY uh, dry erase board. I've talked about a couple videos about it, but not only do I use it for my scheduling, which is very important, I also do take notes with information. So as I'm doing these talky talk videos, if I need to look over at some data information, I could have that listed there. Um, I'll go over the lighting, but uh, you can see how I also have one of these uh, clamp work lights as uh, one of my angles there. But uh, that's just off scene, and then we'll move in a little closer to check the other side out. All right, so we move around. Got my little corner box area here, and what this is is I've got my couple tripods, uh, that little box there carries all my miscellaneous electronic knickknacks and a couple spare hard drives. Down below, I've got my backup hard drive system, NAS. Uh, holds two hard drives up to a total of four terabytes. And then I've got my drive box and then my carry around bag for the G7 camera, as well as my uh, modem and router. From there, got my nice lane leather sofa. And I added that lamp there in the back. It's just kind of to give a little bit of ambient light as well as just a little bit of a softer lighting. Uh, just to kind of soften things up a bit. Now the paddle and the fly pole, uh, they don't fit in my rod rack area in the back. So I just kind of lie them down there. Uh, then we've got the pictures. This top row is uh, will give a hint of where I got my catch and cook abilities. But this first one is I met a bunch of rich Chinese businessmen in North Vietnam. And luckily they felt sorry for me. So I got to go on this quick little uh, junket sail tour of the bays. Of, I think it was Hanoi Bay. Um, stopped at a uh, live fish farm and picked up a bunch of stuff. And they cooked it in front of us. So pretty interesting there. Then we've got a general breakfast lunch deal that I uh, would do in uh, Mozambique on the east coast on the ocean there. Pick up a couple of lobsters from the market, some rice and bread, some papaya, and then uh, just cook it on open fire. I always kept some uh, orange Fanta and some butter in my pack. Then we've got... Uh, this is uh, from my time in the Congo. Uh, this was a uh, monkey Jesus stew, I called it. Basically what they would do is they would go out, kill a monkey, uh, nail it to a cross, arms spread out, and just lay it in the sun for a week to two weeks until it totally dehydrated. Uh, then you can, they would walk around with basically the sticks in the air and you'd just buy them. And then once you got them, create a little fire, you would uh, take the whole monkey and basically just hold it over the fire until all the skin was burnt off. I mean, the, all the hair was burnt off. Then you would just crunch up all the pieces into manageable portion sizes, throw them in a pot, add some water, add a 
can of some tomatoes or tomato juice, some vegetables, seasoning, spices, and then just let it uh, simmer until it was rehydrated. Uh, actually really good. This was in uh, South Thailand uh, in the area of Naratiwat, the southernmost area. Uh, they had a lot of problems with um, Muslim uh, jihadists, so not a lot of tourists go down this far. Uh, a lot of bombings, almost every day there was bombings, a lot of them times at the markets. They'd strap uh, bombs to the little moped scooters and then set them off around there. So there was always boomings going on. But uh, I actually stayed in a brothel, the upper floors on a balcony room overlooking this river that was maybe a, maybe 100 yards from the ocean. So it was actually an outlet inlet. And uh, I had my little travel rods and I was basically catching freshwater fish on the outgoing tide and then saltwater fish on the incoming tide. And uh, keep all those and then all the fish and I'd give it to the mama son downstairs and then she'd cook them up and share them with the girls and I'd go down there every once in a while and eat with them. Uh, but then there was a market across the street in the mornings where I would go and get like this for breakfast and um, as well as get my fresh bait and then another market down the road, I would do the same thing for the evening time. And then here is a general homemade beer recipe that you're gonna find pretty much in every country. Uh, you just basically take fruits, vegetable, peels, uh, grains, wheat, whatever you have spared, throw it in a bin, add some water, a little bit of yeast, and then you just let it ferment, and then natural beer is born. Doesn't look all that great, doesn't taste all that great, but you'll get whacked pretty good. Then for some adventuring, uh, the bottom one here is down in Argentina, which is uh, Ushuaia, which is like the southernmost point of before you get to the South Pole. Uh, actually walked around this lake for, took me a couple hours, climbing over glaciers and stuff in order to get this shot, but came out really well. My, my buddy is in the bottom center there so you can kind of see the the size differences this next one is uh in uh the drc the democratic republic of congo i actually did an overland trip uh through both congos the drc and the republic of congo um a lot of the trip uh was just multiple modes of transportation but a lot of it was on these river barges as well i actually did a lot of uh mapping for the inner Congo. Um, if you actually, actually, if you ever see uh, the Brandt guide for the Congo, they basically ripped off some of my maps. Never really did anything about it, but it was pretty cool. Very dangerous because you're dealing with the military as well as the police force, which are both corrupt sided there. And uh, yeah, probably wouldn't have been caught, been good getting caught down in there with that. Next, we've got, uh, this is base camp at Everest. So that's Mount Everest in the background. And then the white parts in the bottom are actually apartment business, multi-stage story high uh, glacier peaks down there. But that's uh, really where the base camp is actually at. Then we've got, this is Teng Leng La. Uh, it's uh, the basically the high, second high at the time it was the second highest navigable road uh, in the Himalayas or actually in the world. Uh, at the time there was one in Pakistan that was higher, but I think it was military only. And now I think there's actually a Chinese road that's even higher than both of them. But I did it all on this uh, Royal Enfield motorcycle 650. Um, it's basically the English slash Indian version of the. Harley Davidson, probably the most dangerous thing that I've ever done. Um, I crossed over a bunch of the Himalaya mountains, high peaks like that by myself solo. There's no towns, no roads. I would go six to eight hours with nothing in between. Uh, it was the week after they opened up the road, so just the end of winter time. I was passing through these, um, these uh, snow walls that they cut through that were two to three stories high and you just had a narrow path between them for a long time. Uh, rain, slow, snow, sleet, I couldn't stop. I couldn't shut the motor off because if the, the engine died and I had an aura, any type of problems, there was nobody to help and I would have died out there. Uh, 
it was basically, I couldn't even stop to pee. I basically just pissed in my pants the whole ride around there and just uh, cleaned up when I finally got into a village or something. But yeah, probably the, the most sketchy thing that I've ever done. The solo part was definitely not very smart. I lived. And here is a, basically in Ethiopia, the South Omo tribes where they basically live in the old caveman style way down in there. Actually got um, really sick way, way down in there in one of the villages. And then uh, a hooker named Honey took care of me as well as an ex-pro soccer player in uh, England. Uh, kind of took care of me until I recovered. Uh, one day they found me out so bad, they found me out in a field and I just had a blanket over my head staring at the ground. But the whole time I was convinced I was stuck looking up at the stars the whole night and I wasn't able to look away from them, but they took me inside to care of me until I recovered. Then uh, some guys got wind of uh, I was down there and they were planning to do a bit of like a kidnapping thing. So those two basically arranged a truck driver with a truck driver that was going to be passing through shuttled me outside the village and we hid in this ditch until he drove by i jumped in the truck and he took me away from there but uh, anyways the next thing i want to do is go over lighting because lighting is very important so we'll do that now all right for lighting i have those two which are just kind of that ambient light got one of those work lamps there up on top, I've got one of the same style bulbs. And then to my right, I showed you another one of those work lamps. So let's kind of go over what's important. All right, let's talk a little bit about lighting. Um, originally, I started with probably everyone has is the cheap ass light bulbs, a little 60 watt, dime a dozen old school light bulbs. And the net effect of that is yet you get that kind of yellowish, grainy effect, just like if you're out. Uh, filming with your GoPro in uh, at sunrise or at sunset when they're still not very bright out and the cameras work by offsetting the low light to brighten it by uh, enlarging the pixels in order to make it look brighter. And that's why you get it. It's, it's a rough quality image. So to offset that, okay, you can get rid of those. The next step that I went to was these bad boys, these crystal clear, old school bright light bulbs, okay? And what these do is shockingly brighten things up. <laughs> and I, I got these at Home Depot for like $3 each. And I just stuck one in my uh, ceiling outlet and it magnified the brightness considerably and it made the quality a lot better. And I was pretty happy with that. Then what I did is there was actually a 200 watt one and then I actually went up to the 300 watt because I thought more is better. And it's that shockingly harsh lighting is what you get out of that. But compared to just this, it's way better. So you think it's improvement. Then I got this camera and I wanted to match the quality of the lighting with that camera that was capable. So I went to a better budget lighting system and that involves getting clamp lights. And you'll see these a lot in regards to budget filming uh, at home type of setups. And they're basically seven, eight dollars. I got mine at Kmart. You can get them at Home Depot. They basically just fold up, um, use a standard light bulb. But what you want to look for is the CFL style light bulbs. Get a 100 watt equivalent or you might step down to a 60 watt equivalent. But the important thing is to look for a daylight version of it. There's a standard like that'll come out with that little bit of a yellowish tint to it, but you want the, it's a softer glow, but you want, definitely want is the daylight. That gives it the same as if you were outside in bright sunlight and uh, that cl nice clear uh, effect there. Uh, at the minimum, I would get one of these and just clamp it so it's facing directly at you from the next two or behind the camera. So it's just right on your face. So you have a, um, your camera can pick up clarity basically with that lighting. Uh, even better yet, get a couple of them and there's a what's called kind of three-way lighting where you have that same camera that's facing towards you and that shines directly on your face. You'll have a second light that is kind of um, at an angle 
that will cast a brightness on one side to take over those shadows so it's totally lit on one side and it casts a little bit of a light shadow on the opposite side of your face. Then on behind you and on that side you would have a light facing down and be from behind and that would take away a little bit of those shadows there but then it would give you that halo effect on the back and top of your head. And that's kind of a way to focus in on your face basically with the lighting. Um, I did the three lighting, but my primary thing is to kind of make it so there's no shadows really sticking out. Uh, so that's kind of what I did. Then even with these 100 watt bulbs, I'm starting to see that even those are a bit harsh. Uh, if you ever look at those beauty channels where they've got those direct ring lights, and regardless of skin cone, they all look bleached out white. And for some reason, they like that. But uh, anyways, it's just... Even with these 100 watts, they become too harsh. So I went out and bought these, which are some LED 60 watt in daylight. Happened to be on clearance for like eight bucks at uh, Home Depot for eight of them, so I picked them up. But I might convert those to from the 100 watts to these 60s. Um, I'm using those 60s and currently in my side lights just to glow things up and they seem to be about right, take away that harsh brightness. But uh, anyways, that is lighting, so let's talk about audio for a bit. Okay, let's talk about audio. Uh, big pet peeve of everybody. Me, yeah, I don't take it that seriously, but generally there's some definite audio Nazis out there realistically. Uh, but I do understand where they're coming from when it's really, really bad, crackly, um, where you can't even make out what they're saying. But I totally have understandings when it's out in the water. Uh, for this type of yakety yak stuff though, I can understand the less tolerance of not having good audio when you, especially when you can control it in every single way. Now of course you always have the built-in microphones whether it be the a GoPro uh, or a regular camera. However, all of them are considered pretty crappy to be honest. So the recommendation is, is always to get a external microphone source. Now you could spend a thousand dollars easily uh, to get pro type audio, but like I said, I'm not that interested in doing that. As long as you can hear me, it's not all crackly and echoey where I'm not gonna get all those uh, comment trolls about the, the sound part of it, that's more than enough for me. So uh, one of the things that I first started off getting was this Tackstar SGC598 uh, shotgun style microphone plugs into the uh, 3.5 millimeter port on your camera and it's a directional microphone. So general, preferably straight on or a little bit directional on the sides, but really gets reduction in the back. Some are powered, like this one has a 10 decibel gain. You could get the, the uh, uh, more expensive one, spend a couple hundred dollars, get a little bit better clarity, 20 uh, decibel gains as well. So a lot of options. There are, there's the wireless ones and the separate handheld recorders and stuff like that. But like I said, I'm really not interested into it. Uh, 20 bucks for the shotgun microphone by itself and then a $15 for this rabbit cover, wind cover basically, uh, which is kind of important if you're gonna go outside. If it was all just strictly inside like this, then I probably wouldn't need that. But plugs just inside. The only issue that I have with that is, is that it's only effective within a few feet. Um, I'm filming from three and a half feet from here to the camera. So this would be on the outer ranges of the quality side of this, where you're starting to get a little bit far from what it's meant to do. It really needs to be just off camera. So the way I utilize it a lot is when I'm walking around filming something and I'm behind the camera, I have it facing backwards and then I'm talking into it. Just like when I was doing the, the photos uh, descriptions, I always had the camera facing forward but the shotgun mic facing towards me and then I'm within less than a foot of it so that quality is always the best that these can do. Even for being cheap, they're considered pretty good. Um, the other option which I convert for for most of my stuff is this lapel mic. Uh, basically, it's a long corded, I think it's got 20 foot plugged into the side of the camera. Um, and then it has the lapel microphone, probably got the crunch there. Uh, this is the Boya BY-M1 lavalier or lapel microphone. 
and I paid $19.99 for it, I think. Uh, yeah, $19.95 for it. And uh, it works really well because just like having that shotgun right in front of you, this is always right there, so you tend to get better quality that way. Again, you could spend $1,000 for this kind of stuff, get a wireless set, but it works fine. It puts a microphone real close to your, uh, your mouth, so it's clear enough for me. And for 20 bucks, definitely worth the upgrade. So anyways, that is audio. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed a little view of my behind the scenes of my uh, little studio here. Now, in general, is it a necessity to have a professional style studio? Absolutely not, okay? Do you have to have a fish theme background like realistic fishing? Definitely not, okay? But you do have to have quality up to the point that you're not gonna lose viewers, all right? I would say it would be okay that you're not gaining viewers or subscribers, but you don't want your quality to be at a standard where you're gonna lose some of the people that are gonna go like, what is he saying? I don't understand what they're saying. Screw this, I'm out of here. Or if your camera setup is just real fuzzy and it's not very clear and you can't see very well or you're shaking all over or you have bad views, okay? It's just, there's too many channels now that are doing things clean that you really can't have afford to have a poorly videoed video, okay? So, although, like I said, even with fishing, all right, I push this a lot, you don't need that top tier branded name stuff for 98% of the things to go fishing, all right? The fish don't care, I keep saying that. Think about the fish, do they care what kind of boat you're in, what fishing pole you're, you're using, what kind of rod you're using, what kind of, uh, clothes you're wearing, they don't care about that stuff. So put your time and effort into the things they care about. In this instance, do the best with what you've got, okay? Spend $3 at Home Depot and get that good light so that your camera, even though it might not be the best quality, can work up to its basic abilities because it has the light to back it up. If you've got a little bit more money, do the, the cheap lighting system. Spend a little bit of money on the, the sound quality. And that'll get you to the point where, like I said, you're not gonna lose viewers because of that part of it. So that's the only thing I would probably say to keep that standard up, work on things, find a little niche, okay? People do kind of like that when you niche out a certain area, uh, clean it up a bit like I did. You can see my before and afters and uh, see how much different it makes my videos and my channel in particular, how much it's improved in the qualities. And I go back to that same thing as you're growing your channel, why that producing 50 quality videos matters because the first 10, 15 videos are gonna be crap, but those are the times when you're gonna be learning about all this stuff and you're gonna adjust your, your camera style, your angles, you're gonna get better qualities, uh, you're going to work with the lighting, you're going to understand your equipment, you're going to understand how to edit stuff, how to add things, and later on you're going to like, why am I doing that, and then take them away. So that's what those 15, 20 first videos are supposed to be for, your learning process for your trial and error. So it's just like this, you always need to be improving your weak points. So in my instance, that background was pretty blah, okay? It was just plain. I had a little bit of clutter over here, but it was just a wall and a sofa and me, and it was perfectly fine. With the GoPro, things look fisheye. I had the lighting, which is, looks, makes everything look kind of yellowy and kind of washed out, pixelated and rough. And then on top of that, with that fisheye, it was just kind of like, eh, not so good. I did spend some money on this camera, but you don't need to do that. Cell phones do better than the GoPros for just filming. Uh, get the better lighting, cleans things up quite a bit and then you're up to the par and you're not gonna get any complaints and like I said, you're not gonna lose anybody. So anyways, that is my general studio. Hope you enjoyed that and uh, I'll see you next video. Thanks for watching.